You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers, it's one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcast, and today I chat with Marta Sanchez Emden from the Animal Health and Rehab Center in Florida, United States. In my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcast, we learn from vet rehabbers from all around the world how they practice vet rehab. They share their challenges, their wins and losses with us in the hope that we get to learn from their mistakes and we don't make the same ones that they did. They also share their tips and advice on how they navigate through this crazy world we live in today and we get a glimpse into their vet rehab life. Before we head over to my interview, I just want to remind you all of the amazing vet rehabber communities we have on Facebook. Now this is where vet rehabbers from all over the world meet up every day, they share their cases and ask for advice. And it doesn't matter if you have a practice and it's just you. You guys don't need to feel alone, we are all here online for you. So come and join one of the fastest growing vet rehab communities online and learn from like-minded vet rehabbers. Everyone there is wanting to expand their knowledge, learn, and grow to be the best therapist that they can be. We have the Small Animal Vet Rehabbers Group, the Hydro Vet Rehabbers, Equine Vet Rehabbers, and our Business Vet Rehabbers. We'll put the links to that in the description. Now, Marta is a certified vet journalist. She frequently writes articles for magazines and also appears in international Spanish TV channels. She's also written her own book on chihuahuas. She chats to us about her journey and how she has effectively used PR and her involvement in the media to grow her practice, meaning that she doesn't have to pay for advertising. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Over to Marta. Hey, Marta. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. Hi, everyone. Marta, for the listeners, won't you please tell them how you got into the field of vet rehab? Well, first I was in vet school and um, vet school was very uh, overwhelming. I, I also had a baby the second year of vet school. I survived, I made it. I, rehab was not something that we talk about in vet school. This is 29 years ago. Uh, when I graduated from vet school, I started practicing regular conventional medicine. And after like seven years, I, I, I was frustrated. There were some chronic cases that were not helped with medications like chronic arthritis, uh, mobility issues like disabilities. So I got certified in acupuncture. This is back in 2003. So I had all these patients that I was helping with acupuncture that was better, but not quiet. And then I went to a conference in Florida, in Orlando, international conference. And I saw for the first time a lecture in prehab. And I was like, wow. I was surprised because number one, before I entered vet school, I was between vet school and sport medicine. I have always practiced sports. And I'm always uh, interested in how the body works and with emotion and how it make it better. So when I saw that rehab lecture, I like I heard the angels singing (laughs) and I started investigating. And at that time, the only certification available was by the University of Tennessee in United States. So I got certified in rehab and I already had my patients because remember, I was doing acupuncture and I have all these number of patients that I couldn't help the way I wanted to help just with acupuncture and, and conventional medicine. So now what I did, I took all those patients and I started doing rehab using acupuncture as part of my rehab plan. And here I am 18 years later, very happy with my decision and still excited about rehab. I still practice medicine and surgery because those were my patients that I had for many years. Um, But rehab, the rehab feel uh, is what really makes me really excited. And, and I go home and I'm like, wow, I did it. We did it. We made that the walk. And it's really neat. Isn't it amazing? So I have a similar experience um, with getting into the field. And I remember mine wasn't a lecture. It was a, an article that was in, and I think it was the Vet Times. I was working in the UK. And one of our lecturers that actually lectured for us, Lowry Davies, um, she lectures for the online pet health platform. She wrote this article on rehab and I had the exact sort of feeling. I just read this. I thought, yes, this is my answer to all these cases that I was just feeling like I was failing. You know, I, I had all these cases like those chronic old senior dogs and I just felt like 
I'm not, I'm not helping them enough. There must be more that I can do. Um, so I love that. Do you remember who, who the lecturer was that lectured that, that uh, lecture at that conference? Oh my God. I completely forgot the last name, but it's really well-known lecturer and he still teaches at University of Tennessee and he still lectures. And when I go to that conference, which is the biggest conference in the world, the BMX in Orlando, Florida, yeah. I go to his lectures and I don't know completely erase the name from my from my <laughs> mind. I tell you later. <laughs> okay, okay, if it comes to you. Um, and then I also just want to say congratulations for making it through vet school, having a baby in second year. Like, I think back, I, I don't know how you did that. That must have been seriously challenging. I mean, there's just no time at all to do anything. I remember vet school just going to lectures, coming back and studying, 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 studying. So I don't know how you raised the baby, um, how time consuming they are. So well done for doing that. So how many kids have you got now? So I have two sons. One, he was the best school child that is 29 now. And yeah. he's really proud of his mom that he, sure. he was born in the middle of bed school. And, and, and I'm happy <laughs> out of that. And the second one is 13 years old. So big difference in between, because in between, I had to start working, do my certifications. I build my practice. I have two veterinary practice in Miami. One is conventional medicine only. And the other one where I am 100% of my time is integrative medicine where we offer medicine, surgery, and rehabilitation. So it took a, little, um, a few years there, 16 years in between the two babies. Uh, yeah. But I did it, and if I did it, anybody can do it. Woman can do anything. So you've got the two practices. Does the one practice refer to the other one? So do you refer between the two, or they just completely separate? No, they, they, the conventional medicine only practice refers to the practice, the integrative medicine practice, but I also uh, get referrals from, from other practitioners in the area, and I do get referrals from the specialists, the board certified neurologists and board certified orthopedic surgeons, and I also get a lot of patients that just Google uh, my name, find my name in the internet, right? Yeah. Because many owners know about rehab, they search for it and they know about it, even if their own veterinarians haven't mentioned it, which is something yeah, look great. That, that pet owners are so aware of what's out there to help their pets. So you, you're based at the rehab. Are you just doing rehab? You, you mentioned that you're still doing a bit of medicine and surgery. So do you still operate? Yes. So I do medicine and I do surgery and I do rehab and I'm going crazy. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot. It's a lot because I see all this. It's your, your brain. It's easier if it's just in one thing. One is all the three things, you go crazy. So what I have done, I do surgery one day, okay. which is Thursday. But that day also, I do a lot of prosthesis and custom-made braces. So that day is when we do the fiberglass cast or we do surgeries. My brain can accept that. The other days I'm doing uh, rehabilitation, new patients, evaluating them, creating the plan, the program. And that program is follow up by, by my rehab nurses. And so what I see is new rehab patients, follow-ups to see how they're doing every two weeks and the med regular medicine patients. And I go home every night with a lot of medical files to finish my notes, to write the rehab reports. And I'm sure a lot of, of people doing rehab can understand what I'm saying because it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's just no time, right? Because we're spending so much time with our patients. So tell us about your team. So you said you've got your rehab nurses. What does the rehab team um, entail? So what, what people have you got working for you? So I have, we're in the practice where I am 100% of the time, the integrated uh, uh, practice. We have about eight staff members. And some of them are purely veterinary nurses. And some of them are purely rehab nurses. The rehab nurses were first veterinary nurses for many, many years. Uh, I, they are not certified in rehab. I have trained them throughout the years and they attend lectures and wet labs. Um, so they are pretty much specializing what they like. Also, you know, if there's a rehab staff member that love the underwater treadmill, we have two underwater treadmills. So I let them, that's what they do. They enjoy it, that's what they do and they do it well. Yeah, I have others that just love doing laser and manual therapies. I let them do that. So everybody's happy. 
And, you know, all my staff members have been with me at least 10 years. I have some that have been me, with me 10, 20 years, even before I opened my own practice. So it's a very good relation and it works really well. I, and I guess that's why I can get to do everything because I have a really good team. Yeah, that's great. You need a team behind you. So the rehab side of things is happening like the whole time, right? So they, is that full time? Um, and then you're doing the other stuff on the side. So you're juggling lots of balls, Marta. <laughs> yes, it is. But you know what? I like it and I tell you why. And I give you an example. Especially the new patients that come with no referral and no primary doctor, because a lot of people that have no primary veterinarian and the dog is limping or is dragging the hind legs or the neck is painful. And they come here for rehab because they feel that rehab will solve all the problems. I'm glad I'm doing still uh, internal medicine and surgery because I would be saying, okay, you know, your dog is 13, let's rule out hypothyroidism, Cushing's disease, any other metabolic problem that may be causing weakness of the muscles or weakness in general. So I'm able to, look at the uh, disease side of the patient and also be able to recommend and create plans if it's a problem that's purely uh, neurological, muscular, or orthopedic. Yeah, so you yourself can do a full workup because sometimes that can be tricky because if you get referred a case, um, then you got to refer them back to the primary veterinarian. Let's say you suspect some metabolic condition in a, in a case, then you say, well, listen, I'm a little bit worried about this before I carry on with rehab. I'd like you to go back to your primary vet um, and go through all these tests. And then you obviously have to relay that information to the vet, which can be tricky. So it's, you have a, a really good control of the cases that are coming in if they are, have just come in you know, for rehab and have not been referred. So you still have to do that with the ones that you are referred to you, right? You have to be careful because there's yeah. the thing. I, remember I mentioned that I do that when they, with the patients that have no primary clinicians. Yes. They go to the bed like every three, four years only for an emergency. However, in the case that you mentioned where they have a primary clinician, even if they're self-referred, I would say, I suspect your dog may have other things, underlying problems. So before I create a rehab plan, you need a diagnosis and you need to go to your primary clinician. And then I send the primary clinician my report with my recommendations. And the reason I do that is because in Miami, I don't know in, in other cities, but Miami, there's a clinic in every corner. Let me fix that. There's two clinics in every corner. <laughs> so if, if the primary clinicians feel that I'm going to take their patients and do the diagnosis and do the treatment of the regular medicine, then they will not refer to me. So that's what I'm clear about. You have a primary doctor. Okay, your primary will take care of the medical side and I'll do the rehab. However, if they don't have a doctor, then I'm happy to accept them. Um, the same thing is if the patient is referred by a neurologist or, or orthopedic specialist, if they have a primary, I send my report with recommendations to the primary and to the referral specialist. So we all are in the same page. And that's very important for people that are starting a rehab practice that are doing medicine and surgery also, that they have to be, realize that other practitioners may feel that may still, they may steal the patient. You have to be really careful. That's not our yeah. purpose. You know what, we, we want to do just rehab on the, you, we have our own patients, medical patients. Yeah. Yeah, your intention is to do the rehab. And, and like you say, it is so important because it's part of building of those relationships with the referring vets. Um, and it is something that they're scared of. You know, I remember being in practice and it's taking a long time to build up with those relationships. And, you know, afterwards they would come out and be honest. And they said, you know, this is what I was worried about. But then I saw that you didn't do that, you know, um, and that, um, you know, that obviously built up the trust. Um, between us so yeah it is so important if you think about your caseload what percentage are referrals and what percentage are people coming primarily just to you so uh, you actually being the primary vet I would say and this is not this is from my from just thinking about it that probably I get more self-referred people than referral from specialists and the reason is because most people don't go to the specialists you know, specialists are expensive. They have to do expensive diagnostics. So I would say most people are self-referred. However, many times they come self-referred and I say, let's wait a, a second. Your dog has an undiagnosed neurological disease. Your dog needs an MRI. 
you need to see a neurologist. When you see the neurologist, they will send me your diagnosis and we'll take it from there. So even though I will say most than 50% of my patients uh, are self-referred, many times I send them to the specialist and they come back to me because we, we have to have a good, you cannot just do rehab without having a diagnosis. You don't know the prognosis. You don't know if the animal will get worse because we don't know what the animal does. So I prefer to have the patients being referred to me by another person that already did the diagnosis. It's a lot easier for me. I don't get headaches that way. But that's in an ideal world and we don't live in an ideal world and you get people that come from out of the blue with no even no vaccines for their dogs wanting to have rehab. That's a win-win for the specialist, though, because they're referring to you and then they see you referring back to them. Yes. So let's chat a bit about your marketing. So how do these people find you? Initially, it was tough. Like, oh, I can tell you the first 10 years that I was um, doing rehab, they is word of mouth. Because remember, I already have my, my patient, my acupuncture patient, thank God, and there's a lot of word of mouth in, in that area. Um, I did uh, almost solely word of mouth, but I do write a monthly article in the Miami Village Magazine, which is a magazine that is pretty popular down here. And I started writing articles about rehabilitation, about arthritis, about treatment of chronic disease and, and about use of orthopedics and orthotics. And because that's what I like, I think it's boring to write about dental disease and you know the, the, the things that we see all the time. So slowly I would ask how to the owners, how do you find me? We read your article. Slowly now I, I do work in radio and TV and, and radio and TV, these TV shows and radio shows, they want me to talk about the things that we veterinarians always talk about, you know, like uh, itchiness uh, during the um, spring season and how to control, things like that. But I'm trying to infiltrate my rehab because I think it's so exciting and it's a new field and people don't know about it. And when I do, People tell me that, oh my God, that was so interesting. I didn't know you could have a fake limb on a dog. So I'm still working on it. But basically my marketing has been, I really haven't invested any money in it. Yeah, so it's all organic. That's great. How did you get that, that gig in that, in that um, Miami um, newsletter? I mean, um, how, did, how did, you, did you set it up or did they contact you? This is what happens. They, they initially contacted me to sell me an app. Okay. A quarter page chat. And I said, I'm going to buy the, the ad, but I want to write an article. My ad will be an article. And it started getting very popular. And uh, I started getting the magazine have a, a award every month for the best veterinarian, the best hairstylist. And I started getting it every year. So now I have one full page every month with the article and with a quarter page ad for each one of my clinics. Um, so that's how it happened. So you still pay for your, your, your adverts, but they give you the article too? They, for my ad, exactly. So I have a full page that I don't pay for, which is also marketing. Yeah, for sure. And that's a great, that's a great way to, to get in there. And sometimes actually what happens is they realize how beneficial your articles are um, and then they even sometimes will say, hey, listen, if you keep writing for us, um, then you don't have to pay, depending on which, whatever magazine or newspaper or whatever. Um, but that's a great way. So that's a, advice, guys. Listen to this now. So you find a magazine or find a, a, a newspaper, put an ad in, although we know that ads don't really work. Okay. So it's probably, Marta, I mean, you can say your ads are probably not the thing that is actually working. It's probably the article, but that's how you got in, right? You had to say, I'll, I'll pay for the ad. And then they give you the opportunity to write. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, and so tell us about the radio and TV opportunities that you've had. So, so it, it didn't, I didn't plan those things. You never plan. I guess in my, in my case, I didn't plan it. Back when I was doing, uh, starting in acupuncture in 2003, nobody knew about acupuncture. Now everybody knows about veterinary acupuncture. Those times they didn't know. So the local TV came uh, to, do, to do a little story for the local news. And apparently 
a lot of people saw it. So I started getting calls from other news, other channels, and then from morning shows. And slowly, suddenly acupuncture wasn't what they wanted. They wanted me to talk about anything, breeds, care of the dogs, care of the cats. And so, but I'm talking back, I've been doing it like 13 years now. So nowadays, fast forward, I'm the resident veterinarian for uh, Telemundo, which is an international channel that is seen in Latin America and in, in Spain and United States and for CNN in Spanish. So what happens is they just give me the topic. Uh, I have done a lot about COVID. They just give me a topic and I just talk about it uh, five minutes. And this last week I had two channels coming here for the news, making a story on a German shepherd that uh, is missing the hind legs. And we have it on rehab while we're waiting for the custom made prosthesis. So that, that, that was a big story in, in and actually everybody saw it. So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you don't plan things and it happens. It, it, if you make sure that to put your voice out because you want people to know about what, what's good for animals, the marketing just, like you said, is organic. It just happens by itself. You know, I must say, I find with these PR kind of things, especially the TV and the radio and the newspapers, once you get into one show, then they just keep contacting you. So, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been on any TV and I have a similar story to you also getting onto morning shows. And I remember they were always wanting me to talk about worms and nutrition exactly. and feeding. And I was like, no, let me talk about prosthetics yeah. and let me talk about yeah. underwater treadmill and all the fun things. And I actually ended up doing like a, a six series, like morning show thing on all the rehab stuff, which was absolutely amazing. But once you get on, then people see you and then they, and so I still have people that contact me now to come on. And I just refer them now to either to other vet rehab therapists here in South Africa or to other vets, depending on what they want. And um, but you just got to start. So you just got to get onto one thing. Um, and what I always recommend is to have a look and see what channels people are doing things with pets on. Try and find their contact details by Googling them and just keep reaching out. And once you get on one of them, then you'll end up getting on more and more and more and more. What has it done for your practice um, and for your acceptance from other vets? Because that's one of the things that us vet rehabbers, you know, um, and I'm sure where you are now, because you're so established, you're accepted in the veterinary community, um, the rehabilitation side of things. But we have other vet rehabbers in other parts of the world that are really struggling to get recognized by vets. Do you think all this um, PR that you've got in the newspapers, TV, radio has helped you and has helped their perception of veterinary rehabilitation? For sure, for sure. Because when pet owners see you on TV or in even in social media, you suddenly in their eyes are more of an expert. Yeah, It's not necessarily true, but, but somehow that happens. And they say, they think, well, because it's on TV, probably she's very good. Yeah. And, and I think that it, it does help a lot to go out and, and spread the word of what you're doing because it does help a lot. You know, when, when I started the rehab in my practice, even the general practitioners and even the specialists back then, they would not refer for rehab because they feel that, you know, dogs will and cats will rehab themselves. And even nowadays, uh, some people will never refer. I know some general practitioners and a couple of specialists, well, one specialist, they just give a booklet with exercise for the owner to do after surgery. And the booklet is mainly range of motion, like rehab is that. So that's why it's so important that veterinarians that do rehab or people that do rehab go out and have people listen to them and see their face and have video of what they do because rehab is not range of motion. And that's why, I, how they get to know you and trust you and go to you to help their pets. Yeah, I think that being in the media gives you some credibility uh, and not that you weren't credible before, but it, like you say, when, when a pet owner reads or sees you on the TV, they think, oh, wow, this person must be amazing that they're on TV, you know? Um, and, and, and then what happens is they often go and tell the specialist, oh, I saw this lady, this lady vet who does this. And, and then that they'll go, oh, well, let me go look at that. And even for the vets, um, when they see an article being published, you know, so wherever you are, wherever you're being, when you're putting yourself out there, whether it's radio, TV, articles, 
um, that increases your credibility so many times. It's really something that each and every one of us must do. And I know for some of us that, you know, being out there, we're not all that brave. I mean, I remember for me, the first time going on radio, the first time on TV, I remember going on live TV in the morning and I, I mean, I, I was so nervous, so, so nervous. And every single time, even when I was doing the recordings and, you know, I think often when we look at other people and we see them, they look so comfortable, but they're actually not. And so I just want all of you guys to know that, that we're not like, I can say for myself, I don't know about you, Marta, but every time I go on TV, every time I go on radio, I am so, so nervous, but I do it because I know that it's important. And I know so, that I need to share that message. It's funny you say that initially I was really nervous, especially in TV when it's live TV. Because yeah. your word, you have like X amount of minutes, it's live. If you mess up, you mess up and horrible. So what I did initially is like, I will almost memorize every word that I have to say if, if they gave me the questions before, which not always happens. And, and I was so tense. And then I realized, that it, I just imagine that that person interviewing me is a pet owner in my yeah. clinic and forget about the cameras. Then it just happens, it's beautiful. So slowly throughout the years, I have gotten used to just talk. Yeah, so are you not nervous at all now? Not at all. Not a at little all. bit, not even a little bit. And actually, not at all, not at all. And actually some, especially the morning shows, they like to give you the questions already said and I, you know, I go like, I really don't think that question is important. So what I'm going to do is like politicians, you do, you know, I answer a little bit what they want and I switch the topic to the answer that I want. Or the, and I, so I can get my information, especially the rehab information in the yeah. topic. <laughs> yeah, I must say, I never ever got there where I wasn't nervous. I, I will say for lecturing, um, now I'm a whole lot more comfortable standing up and lecturing, but the TV thing, especially if there's a rack on those morning shows, sometimes there's some really good looking men that will interview <laughs> you. Yeah. You know, and they can make you just, yeah, feel really, really nervous. I remember the one TV show I used to have this guy, he was really, really sweet. Um, but he was very intimidating and um, his, his looks and his old personality intimidated me. Well, but if you look closely, you realize they have makeup and a lot of hairspray and that makes you laugh <laughs> yeah. and then you get relaxed and you forget about your stress. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, tell us about your social media. So what, what kind of social media marketing are you doing? Um, you said you're not doing any pay things. So um, obviously all of it's organic. What's your, your social media strategy look like? So I have um, Instagram and I have, Facebook and, and Twitter. It's a lot of work, like you probably know because you do it really well. I I don't use it, I, I do it myself. I know that I a lot of people suggest have a veterinary uh, team member to do it, but I just like to give the picture that I took and make my comment. And I, I just put a little bit of the everyday life. Sometimes I put a little bit of my personal life, not, not often, but sometimes I do that. And it's just for fun. I, I, I know I'm not doing it properly, but I get a lot of response and, and I do have some people that come to me because some uh, social media uh, personalities, so a very well-known Frenchie is following me and that, that Frenchie tells his other Frenchie friends to follow me. But I, I, I do it for fun and still, even though I not really have a strategy, it's working. Okay, so you're doing all of that yourself? I do it on myself, yeah, yeah. At nighttime before going to sleep, on a weekend, I take the videos and yeah. I, I just have fun with it. I wish I had more time to dedicate to that. And is that many the rehab side of things that you're doing or are you doing the whole, the whole clinic? No, it's mainly rehab and I, I have very interesting surgical cases and medical cases, but I'm biased and I do, I'm excited about rehab so I, put in there what makes me happy and excited. And, and, and that's why I put mostly rehab. Yeah. And the other side of the clinic, so the medical and surgical side, is that really busy too? Um, so are you having to, to market and feed patients in there? It's, it's really busy, but this is what I have done because rehab takes a lot of my time. So when I started offering rehab, I decided I'm not going to keep sick patients overnight. If they're sick where they need IV fluids overnight, I'm going to refer to a 24-hour clinic. Uh, if it's a patient that is an internal medicine patient, very challenging, 
I refer immediately to an internist. The same with surgery. If you have a surgery that the dog needs orthopedic surgery and it needs care afterwards with major pain control, I refer to an orthopedic practice. I'm lucky enough that in Miami, we have all kinds of specialists and all kinds of 24 hour clinics. So I'm spoiled in that way. But if I, that's the only way to be able to have time to do rehab. So yeah. we do surgery and, and, and internal medicine outpatient. We don't hospitalize anybody. Okay, and, and you don't hospitalize your rehab patients either? I used to before COVID. Okay. And I was happy about it because I would tell um, the owners, you know, we, we do really good care of patients with disabilities that are, and it's also for me easier to work with. When COVID came, we had uh, staff, limited staff because that one was in quarantine, this one is sick. So I had to stop the, yeah. the, uh, the boarding for an hospitalization of rehab patients. So, we still on curbside, we still are with the closed doors. However, my other practice, which is purely medicine and surgery, have a big area for uh, boarding. So if we need regular boarding, we send the patients here. If it's boarding for rehabilitation patients, they just come. The thing is that we usually work with my rehab patients no more than two to three times a week. There's no one that I work every single day with. Mm -hmm. So I, I will work here with the patient and then the owners have homework to do at home on the days they're not here. And that's how we have been able to balance the not offering hospitalization for patients with disabilities. So how many patients is your rehab side of your clinic seeing per day? Oh, I will say 15 or 20 that come for therapy. And new patients that come for evaluation, they want to know if rehab is an option, maybe maybe like four per day, four okay. or five per day. And you said you've got two underwater treadmills. Yes. What, what other equipment have you got? So what other modalities have you invested in? So I have, uh, I have three lasers. Um, I have electrical simulation uh, therapeutic ultrasound and all the equipment for manual therapy and exercises, you know, the peanuts and all those things. I do have uh, acupuncture, electroacupuncture, which is another modality that to, to me, I consider part of rehab because I use it so much. Um, and I, I think that's basically it. Okay. I'd love to know how you, you went on to getting the two treadmills. Did you start off with one and then built it up? Because that often is the case. I mean, vet rehabers have one treadmill and then they're in this sort of quandary. Like we could get another one, but will we have enough patients? To exactly. You're, you're very one? right. So this is what happened. I got the first one in 2004. When treadmills, nobody know, knew what a treadmill was. And that one's still working beautifully. Great, wow. great, great, yeah, great purchase. And then like last year, actually for COVID, every veterinarian became really, really busy. And I, we've been, my veterinary rehabilitators have been telling me we need another one, we need another one. And like, no, we can't do it because I didn't want to invest more money in it. Yeah. No, we can't do it, we can't do it. So finally when COVID came, we couldn't, we were telling people you need rehabilitation in the water, but it would be three weeks before we can start the therapy. And, mm -hmm. and that's ridiculous. You know, the dog needs it now or the cat. Sometimes we use it in cats. So I decided to go for it. The first on the water treadmill was paid for, so why not? So we got a second one and we are so busy now with two that I'm like, how did we survive with only one? So I, I, my, my advice is if your practice have grown and you feel you need it, get it because it will, be, it will pay for itself and, and you can help a lot more patients, you know? Yeah, it's sort of when it's there, it just fills up, right? I mean, it's the same sometimes when people, like maybe they've got a pool and then they're thinking about getting the underwater treadmill and they say like, well, you know, then we want to, now we're going to move all the patients. Some of them will stop swimming. Some of them will still swim. Then maybe we're half full in the pool and half full in the treadmill. For some reason, it doesn't ever work that way. You just stay as full in the pool and then your treadmill just eventually gets full too and you chock a block it's like the more the more opportunities you have so the universe just sends those rehab patients your way yeah yeah and here in miami you know we have the ocean there so people always tell me well what if i put the dog in the pool or in the ocean and because people like to do that so I, 
depending on the case, I said, okay, you can, if it's a candidate, you can do this in the, in the pool or in the ocean, but we have to do this in the, in the underwater treatment and they love it. And some people are asking for underwater treadmill, even on the first appointment where I'm evaluating the patient. And I tell them, this is not a underwater treadmill uh, case, right? And they're like, no, but we want it, we want it. And I don't know what's it. So again, if you feel you need a second one, get a second one. If you don't have any, you, you need to get it. I think my two modalities that I use the most are laser and underwater treadmill by far. So no regrets in any of the equipment that you bought? Um, dental x-ray machine, but that doesn't have to do anything with rehab. Um, I think that uh, since I'm using the laser, I use less the E-STEM uh, unit. I still use it, yeah. but, less. but what I use a lot also, not as much as laser, but I use a lot the therapeutic ultrasound because that's for different issues. So, yeah. but the E-STEM, the electrical stimulation unit, I don't use it as much. Okay. But it had its time and its place. Oh yeah, I wouldn't give it away. No, no, the thing is that, yeah. No, you need everything. You need all the toys. But yeah. the ones I use the most are certain because you always see certain problems more commonly. Yeah. Even though you see a lot of things, there's like two or three problems that you're going to see all the time. So what are your plans for the future? So uh, do you think that you are going to 100% move into the rehab? Because I get the feeling that's completely where your passion is. Like, if you could have it, you would just be doing that? Or do you think that you're gonna carry on? Are there more clinics that you're wanting to open up? What are your plans? I certainly don't want to open more clinics. I certainly don't want to get bigger because in that stage of my life that I've been practicing 28 years, I kind of want to take it. I want some time to do my personal hobbies, right? Uh, in an ideal world, and this is what I would like, I would like to stay with rehab only. And my, I have an associate, maybe get a second one, and let them do surgery and medicine. I can dedicate myself to rehab, maybe less days a week, <laughs> maybe like four days a week. That would yeah. be ideal. If it will happen, I don't know, but that that's, yeah. would be ideal. And then dedicate more time also to the um, communications, you know, the, doing the TV and the radio and the reading articles on social media. Yeah, you enjoy that. I enjoy it. I, I don't know why. I It happened, I enjoy it, I will keep doing it. Yeah. Um, so if you had to give vet rehabbers that are just starting out any advice, what advice would you give them? I, you know, I would say constant, when you start rehab, start working with one or two things like, like modalities I'm talking about. Start with manual therapy and water or laser and water. And as you get to know better your cases and know the the real expectations, then add other toys. And the reason is because rehab is the trendy thing here in the United States. And a lot of clinics, especially corporate clinics, want to expand and offer it and bring patients for that field. And then they buy all the toys. And they put a person that maybe a doctor, maybe a technician certifying rehab, and that person is doing everything. Every patient that comes gets a stem, ultrasound, water, acupuncture, every day and that's not how it works so you have first to learn with one or two modalities and once you know what you can get what you can milk out of those modalities then add a third one and then a fourth one because at the end then you know exactly what you have and what you need you're going to have a lot of people come in and say i want my dog to get water acupuncture and laser and you will have to tell them as a doctor wait your dog has this condition what will help initially is number one, after two or three weeks, if it's better, then we can add number two, and number three will never be used for this condition. But if you don't, you have to first play with your, with your modalities and, and learn what you can get from them. Yeah, I love it. Just take it step by step. I find it so interesting that um, there in Florida, you have people that come in and say what they want you to use. All the time. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. I and mean, I can't remember in practice ever that happening, except the underwater treadmill. So, so when you said that, it also rang a bell for me. I remember, you know, they would come in and like you said, the very first consult, before you've even assessed or managed their pain or anything, they're like, are they going in the underwater treadmill? You're like, no, not yet. You know, yeah. there's still a lot of pain here. We need to sort that out before we can even start doing the underwater treadmill. So I had that. 
but never about any of the modalities. Um, they, they never knew anything about that. So um, it must be that you're doing a good job at educating them. Thank you. I do get a lot of special human physical therapies or uh, trainers like the, the uh, coach for, a, I don't know, basketball team that they want, I want this. Listen, Dr. Sanchez, I want the water and I want this and I want you to do it really, really challenging because my dog needs to be, and I have to say, no, calm down, calm down. That's not how it works. This is what we're going to do. Because you cannot let the owner dictate what's going to happen. They have no knowledge of the treatment or sometimes even the diagnosis. And what happens is that animal get hurt, who's responsible? You are. So I don't think that rehabbers should follow anybody's rules or any pressure from pet owners. Do what you know how to do and you'll have good results. Yeah, great advice. If you look back at your journey, what is the biggest challenges um, in your rehabilitation clinic that you've had? Space. I have a freestanding building. I wish I had a lot of space because for rehab, you need a lot of space. And you have all these, like I said, I have several patients having treatment at the same time on a day. I have the, the two underwater treatment full and one having laser, another one having manual therapies here. And, and maybe this dog doesn't like this dog and they're barking. And so you really need a lot of space. And when I started, I when I bought my practice, the one where I'm doing the rehab, I I knew I wanted to do rehab, but I didn't know how big it was going to get. I have no idea that that's so many years ago that I have no clue. There was no rehab anywhere. So I wish I had more space, but at this point in my career, I don't think I'll be selling my building and moving to another place. So I'm going to continue like, like we are, we're yeah. okay. And so what, what do you need space, space to, to keep animals or space to consult? What are you limited in at the moment? No, we have rooms to consult. Is a space where we can uh, put our ground. I have two ground treatments too. So I have two ground treatments, two underwater treatment. I have all these rehab masks that are huge for the manual therapies and for bigs. Right now, before uh, starting the, the conversation with you, I was doing an acupuncture on a, on a 155 pounds dog so it takes all the space so it's really space to do the actual uh work on hands-on on the animal okay it's just treatment space yeah, treatment space, yeah. i think it's a problem this, that a lot of us have and the thing is that the the treat the medical and surgical treatment is another area of the hospital so the rehab patients are not there so the rehab space, actually I have a second building, which is rehab, but it's a tiny building. And that's where I have all my toys and that's where we do everything. And I have a good area for gate evaluation. And I love that area. And there's no room to expand the building. No, it's, no, it's an, we are in South Miami, which is a really cute little area of the town and, and uh, with old houses, really, really cute. And there's no way where to move and yeah. probably impossible to get any permits. So that's what I'm saying that at this stage in my career, I don't think I'm going to be selling and moving. And really in, the, in my city, what's available is the strip malls, a big space in a strip mall. And I don't want to be in a strip mall. I like it here. And so I'm, I'm going to continue like doing my best with what I have. Sometimes we just need to make do with the space. And we do, we manage, right? Yeah, yeah. Everything's so, cool. um, I, I, it amazes me all the things that you do. So um, on top of your own social media and your practicing and the rehab and all the PR things that you do, um, what are the hobbies that you want to spend some more time doing? Well, the other thing that gets me excited that's rehab is my hobby. I practice fencing, uh, competitive fencing at an uh, international level. And so, and, and that happens because when I was in, in high school, I was in the, in my country in Puerto Rico, I'm from Puerto Rico, I was in the national team and it has to stop everything for bed school and for having the, my family and the, building the practice. So about six years ago, I decided I want to do it again. Yeah. So I, now I train about four or five times a week after, after work, that's why. <laughs> And I uh, compete um, fairly like every month and a half, two months I go out of town for a competition. Uh, I went to Egypt before, in 19, before the COVID, I went to Egypt and Slovenia and Italy to compete. 
of course, during COVID, everything has changed. Um, no competitions, and now in we start again in August to compete. I see a whole lot of medals in the background. Are those your fencing medals? Oh, you can see that. Yeah, yes, those are fencing medals. <laughs> wow, congratulations. That's amazing. I don't think I've ever met um, anyone that does fencing. Um, oh, not you. There's a lot of, of people, well, not a lot, but there's some veterinarians that are fencers uh, in the yeah. United States and I'm sure in other countries in the world. Yeah. Awesome. Well, good luck in August um, with your next friend. And thank you so much for taking the time. It's been wonderful chatting to you. Oh, I love the opportunity and nice meeting you, Megan. You too, Marta. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review. And know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.